My name is Christopher Samuel. I'm an artist who makes work about identity and disability politics. I've been working with the National Trust and the Research Centre for Museums and Galleries at the University of Leicester to uncover little known and often untold histories of disability. Hello, I'm Alexandra Shaw. And this is my sign name. I'm a deaf British Australian and mostly work as an English to British Sign Language translator. I'm also dedicated to fighting for equal rights for deaf and hard of hearing people. Researching disability history is complex. For a whole range of reasons, we often know less about the lives of disabled people in the past than we do about non-disabled people. Negative and stigmatising attitudes can mean that our archives are partial, and it can be difficult to build a full picture of the lives of disabled people, especially in their own words, as well as the social norms and attitudes that shape their experience. Contemporary attitudes towards disability can also play a part in obscuring or distorting the past. Our approach places experience and expertise around disability at the heart of a collaborative research process. We're interested in how these stories can be ethically researched and presented in new ways. And our aim is to build and to share fuller and richer stories of the trust sites, their collections, and the people who lived and worked there. By highlighting gaps and omissions, we raise questions about the stories that cultural institutions choose to tell and those they overlook or choose to silence. Everywhere and Nowhere is about telling these stories. This painting was bought by the Lewis family from Clanaheron in the 20th century and was created by artist Sarah Biffin. It is the only Biffin painting in the Trust's collection. Sarah Biffin was a celebrated female disabled artist. She was born in 1784 into a working class family. As a young teenager, she appeared in travelling fairs where people paid to watch her paint. Her talents and skill in fine miniature brushwork attracted the attention of the Earl of Morton, who introduced her to prominent artists and funded her lessons. She became a successful independent miniature painter and set up a studio in Bond Street in London. She was awarded a medal by the Society of Arts, exhibited work at the Royal Academy and received commissions by the Royal Family. When the Earl of Morton, Biffin's patron and friend, died, interest in her work diminished and her financial position became increasingly precarious. She was later awarded a civil list pension from Queen Victoria, which allowed her to retire. Her art today remains highly collectible. Our next story also reveals a life of shifting agency, autonomy and influence. Sir Geoffrey Hudson was born in 1619 in Oakham in Rutland. His place in the historical record was secured when Queen Henrietta Maria, the wife of King Charles I, took him into her service as a court performer after he leaped from a pie at a dinner. After this, Geoffrey was often described as the Queen's Dwarf. The National Trust has three paintings of Geoffrey in its collection, including this one on display at Petworth House in West Sussex. Although this striking painting by Charles Jarvis after Van Dyke features both members of the royal household 
it's clear at a glance who this portrait is about. Even though Jeffrey was a royal favourite with increasing independence and agency, he appears not as a person in his own right, but as a prop or a possession. He is a symbol intended to show the Queen's love of dance, music and theatre. But if we dig a little bit deeper, we find that Geoffrey had a rich life, full of fascinating stories and adventures beyond the royal court. We all recognise Henry VIII, and the trust holds multiple portraits, including this one at Charcot Park in Warwickshire. But how many of us know that he sustained two injuries in 1536, which resulted in his use of a series of mobility aids? As he got older, he used a walking stick, a wheelchair, and a pulley mechanism installed at Whitehall Palace to lift him up and down the stairs. Henry VIII crafted his image carefully, hiding his impairments to present a highly constructed image of power and kingship. But what does that say about the relationship between disability and power throughout history? Whose interests are we protecting when we shy away from discussing disability today? Henry VIII was able to control his own public image, but the majority of disabled people did not have this level of power. We see this in this story of Nicholas Ward, whose public image and the records held about him were controlled by others. Born in 1750, the story that tends to be told of Nicholas Ward is that he compromised the financial stability of his family, who branded him as a madman and a lunatic. He was described as rude and unmanageable by his tutor. However, a closer look at the records reveal a more complex story. Nicholas set off on a grand tour like lots of other wealthy young men. In his personal letters, he wrote of his loneliness and his difficulty to learn to speak French. He said, unless I was to spend two years here, I believe I would not be able to converse well in the French language. But I would be very sorry to stay here so long a time. He was elected an MP in the Irish House of Commons from 1771 to 1775. But his family's actions prevented Nicholas from inheriting the full castle ward estate and its wealth, as he would have usually done as an eldest son. In 1785, on a petition of his brother and his uncle, he was placed under disability by a bill of the Irish House of Lords. This tiny silhouette is the only record we have of Nicholas and a trace of a life which we know very little about. Killerton in Devon holds Lady Lydia Ackland's music collection. Which includes the score to this popular song called Crazy Jane. Crazy Jane, along with Mad Bess and Crazy Sally, were fashionable fictional characters in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. With words written by Matthew Gregory Lewis, 
A music by Harriet Abrams. This song tells the story of a heartbroken woman experiencing mental distress. Songs like this were written to discourage men and women from entering into relationships outside of marriage. Despite portraying Jane as overly emotional, hysterical and unstable, this song tells listeners not to fear her and in part encourages sympathy for Jane's situation. The contradictory and often stigmatising attitudes towards mental health that the song conveys still resonate today. Yeah, my Jenny was born in 1919. As a child, she visited Gork Abbey in Derbyshire regularly to see her grandparents, Sir Vaughancy and Isabel Lady Crewe. She moved to Cork in 1949 when her brother Charles inherited the estate. In the 1940s, Ermine worked at the Army Remote Centre at Melton Morbury. Following an accident when she was kicked by a horse, the life of Ermine and her family changed dramatically as she found herself unable to speak. With the support of her family, particularly her devoted brother, Henry, she learned to speak again. In her speech therapy book, she describes him phonetically as Henry, the listener. As part of her therapy, she was asked to write seven sentences to practice. Ermai wrote, I like men who smoke a pipe. The book reveals something of Ermai's warmth and her sense of humour, as well as the value she placed on her relationship with her brother, Henry. Marcus Richard, also known as Dick, the third Viscount Bearstead embroidered these 12 chair seat covers with seasonal floral designs. Possibly one for each month of the year at Upton House near Banbury. This was part of his rehabilitation for an injury to his hands, which he sustained during the Second World War. It is rumoured that he would get his family to embroider the boring backgrounds, leaving the more interesting sections for himself. Embroidery was often taught as a means of post-war rehabilitation at this time and the designs probably came from the Royal School of Needlework at Hampton Court. Our research revealed many stories of disability built and woven into heritage buildings and objects. Tridega House, on the edge of Newport, was home to Courtney Morgan. Who inherited the title of Lord Tridega in 1913. Courtney made adaptations to the house as his sight diminished. He added handrails inside and outside the house he also removed the glass cover from his watch so that he could feel the time. Courtney was clearly close to his servants, creating a supportive working environment for his employees and the estate residents who had a range of impairments. A 
a footman, record Courtney laughing with deaf stud groom Jack Vaughan while out hunting about the fact they made a bloody fine pair. I'm blind and you are stone deaf. Courtney and his uncle both supported the Cardiff Institute for the Blind and the Newport and Monmouthshire Blind Aid Society. With his uncle setting up guided visits to the estate for blind visitors. Geoffrey Winthorpe Young was a celebrated mountaineer yeah. and rock climber, as well as a poet, author and educator. He was injured in the First World War, which resulted in one of his legs being amputated. To enable him to continue climbing, Geoffrey designed and adapted a prosthetic leg. He had a number of detachable feet for scaling different types of rock and snow. In a letter he wrote to his friend George Mallory, he described his experience of rock climbing after his injury as the immense stimulus of a new start. With every little inch of progress, a joy instead of a commonplace. Jeffrey was described by many as a man with intuitive sympathy. He encouraged others who had returned from the war with injuries to continue activities they loved. In 1923, the Fell and Rock Climbing Club gifted 12 mountain summits in the Lake District to the National Trust as a war memorial. Jeffrey was invited to write and deliver a dedication speech at the unveiling ceremony. Over 500 people listened to his tribute in the rain, wind and mist at the top of the summit. Two hundred years, Wellbrook in County Tyrone, Northern Ireland, was a water-powered beadling mill used in the manufacture of linen. Beadling was the final process in making linen. It involved pounding cloth with large wooden mallets called beetles. Pounding of the beadling was loud and relentless, hammering from dusk till dawn. Although we know that workers in this industry often became deaf or experienced hearing loss as a direct result of their working conditions, there are no historical records of this at Wellbrook Beatling Moon. of information about disabled people's histories in the past, there is a risk that cultural institutions could present objects and stories in ways in which erase disabled histories and pre-produce untruths that are harmful to disabled people's lives today, leaving little room for empathy, understanding, human connection. We know we can do more as we expand our research to tell the histories of the connections to our sites that reflect all our lives. We are committed to exploring how we tell disabled people's stories in ways which are as respectful and ethical as they are engaging and enlightening. Developed with disabled collaborators and experts in disability history, 
Our research to date suggests that there are connections to disabled people's lives indeed everywhere. Budding through our buildings, our landscapes, our collections and our historical records. The 10 stories we share here are just a fraction of the many connections to disability across the National Trust, which we plan to uncover and share in the future.